Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Informed and Engaged. I'm Lashara Bunting, Director of Journalism and Knight Foundation. In the past several weeks, we've seen dozens of journalists of color who have come forward and shared their personal stories of racism in newsrooms. And as a result, we've seen renewed efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion in journalism. For today's show, we want to go deep and talk about the weight, some might say the burden, that journalists of color experience in newsrooms and the tangible solutions that have emerged to help address these issues. Today, we are joined by Aaron Williams, co-founder of the Journalists of Color Slack and an investigative data reporter for the Washington Post, and Michelle Lee, president of the Asian American Journalists Association and a national political reporter at the Washington Post. This is gonna be a great discussion. And for those watching, please submit your questions in the q and If you're on Facebook, submit them there. For those on Twitter, please use the hashtag Night Live. We hope to get to a few of those at the end. Thank you for joining us, Michelle and Aaron. Thank you so, so much. So let's dive right in. Uh, yes. So when you're a journalist of color in newsrooms, right, there is this often an invisible burden, right, this, and, and also, right, the invisible work uh, that goes along with that, especially for those of uh, us who want to push change in newsrooms. I'd like for each of you, you know, briefly to talk to me about how you've handled this throughout your career. Aaron, why don't you kick us off? You want me to start? Okay, I'll start. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think uh, being a journalist of color in a newsroom uh, offers a lot of really exciting opportunities. Uh, when you think about the way media covers any group, uh, you know, the model culture of media can over time kind of create a very specific kind of narrative around uh, an, a group or uh, any kind of organization or people uh, around the world. And so when you get an opportunity to tell those stories, uh, not only as a representative of your community, but also as someone who maybe has seen kind of the other side of media coverage of your community, I think there's a lot of power there. Um, however, often what happens, I feel like as journalists of color is that we have to kind of play on two fields. It's like we have to do the work of being journalists and, you know, being fair and accurate and those kind of things. And then on top of that, we have to kind of do this other work to uh, make sure that um, you know certain narratives or prejudice or uh, kind of like tropes aren't re being reused in um, our coverage in our organizations, and then also I think just dealing with the microaggressions and things like that ourselves. So I think in like in my career, uh, it's been kind of interesting because because I work in in data journalism. There, uh, it's a very it's a it, while it's been. A, a field that's kind of grown in a long, over a long period of time, it is one of the newer kind of models within journalism. And so because of that, it offered a lot of opportunity to really early on kind of set what the expectations were. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, I think how I've got along or around it has been kind of, you know, having these kind of discussions off network with like my friends, other colleagues, and, you know, the JOC Slack community kind of came out of that. Uh, discussion of us just kind of feeling really exhausted of having to consistently talk about uh, microaggressions that we either had from other colleagues or editors or even just framing around coverage of specific people groups. So I mean, I think the JLC Slack specifically is kind of um, a, a direct byproduct of my experience uh, and, and just having to deal with uh, hearing, uh, you know, being in a uh, uh, a journalist of color, having to constantly think about not only how you're being seen within the newsroom, but then how your organization as a whole covers uh, just the world at large. And I think you've really touched on uh, a really important part of it for not just journalists, but when you're in sort of the more specialized areas like data, right, uh, like investigative journalism, uh, that burden uh, is even harder. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about the JOC Slack, which is a, a, an invaluable resource. Uh, but Michelle, I'd love to hear your take. Yeah, I mean, I connect with that so much. You know, I joined AJ when I was 18 years old as a college freshman coming from Guam and I went to college in Atlanta and I was literally halfway around the world from home and I just didn't know how to start a career in journalism. And the family that I found through AJ was just so 
uh, shape, just shape my career and who I am as a person and really instilled the value of media diversity early. So I feel like over the years, um, being a working journalist, it's just been second nature for me to make sure that media diversity is just a priority for me. Um, but, and, you know, I started my career in Phoenix, Arizona, where there's a really small AAPI community. Um, and I was the one who was trying to connect my news outlet with ethnic media to try to make sure that um, communities voices are being heard. And this has just been such a big part of just who I am and how I live my career in life. And I feel like that is the case with so many of us journalists of color who care about diversity. And um, while it's great to have that passion, it is, uh, it takes up a huge chunk of my non working time. Like I spend probably most of my like free time that I'm not sleeping or hanging out with friends, like thinking about this, talking about this, working on this, sharing resumes, creating spaces with for conversations with friends and colleagues, um, making sure that people's good work is being elevated. And it's um, even though a part of who I am, it is an added burden and something that I have taken on for myself. And, you know, I, I find it so necessary because it's everything from, like Aaron said, making sure the right stories are pitched, pushing back to certain narratives that are being formed within the newsroom, um, making sure that when there are jobs open, the right candidates get um, elevated to the right, you know, people who need to see them. Um, but at the same time, there's kind of this pressure that I've faced. I don't know if uh, um, others have faced as well, but, you know, I never want it to seem like I'm sacrificing my work priorities for my non-work but work adjacent priorities of diversity. So I always have to make sure that I'm doing my work and making sure I'm doing good stories and I'm producing the right stuff as a working journalist, as well as advocating for what I care about, which I believe will improve the industry. So it's been a juggling act my whole career. So um, this burden, right? This, this, and, and, uh, and burden seems like a strong word, but really, I mean, Michelle, you really point to it because I, uh, in many ways, I think um, leadership at news organizations really don't understand the additional hours. I, I like to refer to it as the invisible work. It's important work, but it's invisible work that you don't uh, get credit or paid to do. So to that end, in this moment of reckoning uh, around race um, in the world, in the United States, and in journalism, what are the ways in which newsrooms can step up? right, to address this sort of burden that's always existed. Um, what, are, what do you think newsrooms can do? Um, I think newsrooms need to really care and put money behind this issue from the top down. You know, we're so used to this as journalists of color of our recruiters and bosses hitting us up, like emailing or pulling us into their office and saying, hey, we have this job op open. Do you know any diverse candidates who'd be good for that? I do, and I have resumes upon resumes, but I think it's time that editors and recruiters and, and people at the highest levels of the industry actually develop their own talent network of journalists that they personally monitor and care about and want to recruit into their news organization over a long period of time. I think this needs to be a complete mind shift change in the way newsroom leaders approach hiring and cultivating leaders within their newsroom. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is the fact that this fight isn't new. We've been pushing for this for decades. AJ was created in 1981. We're almost 40 years old and we're still having the exact same conversations. And I think the real um, opportunity here is for people at the highest levels to really make sure that they do their work to care about this and put real funding behind this. It has to come from the real tangible actions of news executives and news owners and the people who fund them and the and the way that the news executives distribute their money throughout the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. No, please, please. Say, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Michelle and I briefly spoke about this, but definitely I think the uh, like basically has to come down to money and, and resources and positioning. I think there's been a lot of well-intentioned editors um, and news executives who have tried to address this, but typically what you hear is, you know, my door is always open. You know, if you have, you know, go ahead, send me resumes of, you know, diverse candidates or this or that, but it's always, always the onus comes back on working journalists of color to, you know, basically do the work for the company, right? On top of, as Michelle said, do our day jobs, make sure we're still producing, you know, excellent journalism at the same time. And this, you know, this work isn't paid uh, and we do it to some level out of, you know, 
uh, out of because we care for our community, because we care about progress and things like that. But a lot of it too. I mean, I when I first got into this work, it wasn't because I, you know, like sure to some level there was like this act, this uh, me wanting to advocate for journalists of color. But a lot of it became came out of pure frustration of feeling like I couldn't break into an industry that I knew. Uh, I wanted to work at that. I saw other people who, uh, whether they were white or came from, you know, more elite colleges had kind of this clear pathway to success. And yet I was coming with the same drive, the same energy and was me meeting robots for no other reason that I could ascertain in terms of other than not being, you know, looking like them or coming from the places they come from. And so, uh, you know, I think that this idea of like, what can news executives do now? I mean, part of it is like, okay, well, you, you know, you've had this open door policy. It's like, you can come in and say whatever you want, but like, okay, clear, like, and, and there's so many examples of journalists who have walked through that door and said, hey, I'm dealing with this, whether it's, um, and it goes beyond uh, race, right? Whether it's sexism, homophobia, uh, you know, who, who, there's journalists who have tried to advocate within their organizations. And it's the same kind of rhetoric, which is like, we hear you, you know, I'll, I'll bring this up with HR, with other managers, and maybe there's like some kind of meeting, but it doesn't really translate into actual change. And I think to, to translate to actual change goes down to hiring, it goes down to what we incentivize as success, which, you know, uh, can look like a lot of different things, whether that's the actual talent you recruit to uh, the salaries you pay out to uh, how, like, what you decide is, is good journalism. I mean, all of these things are things that I think news organizations need to think about. And it can't just come from the, you know, the, the people like Michelle and I who have been doing this work for years. It has to come from the top down as well. Uh, and that, and, and I mean, no, the only way that's going to happen right now is pressure, which is what we're seeing groups like AAJ and others doing to, uh, you know, advocate for this, uh, for what we've been asking for, as Michelle said, for like, you know, decades at this point. Yeah, and just to add on really quickly, um, you know, real, realistically speaking, this bottom up approach that has existed for decades is asking working journalists with no real power to put their own political power within their organization on the line for the purpose of improving the entire organization. You know, when I bring a name to my editors or the recruiters, I'm putting my backing behind that person and making, you know, I'm the vetting person um, on behalf of another minority journalist that I believe in. And you're asking workers to do this over and over again and continue to use their political capital that is quite limited as, a, as an employee. And um, I think managers and newsroom executives need to recognize that, that this burden is not just, you know, extra time. It's actually how we perceive and are perceived to have a place in our own newsrooms as well. And I think that when you see newsrooms that actually care from top down and you see newsrooms that don't actually and are working on this bottom up model, it's actually very clear from people like us who actually cares and who doesn't. And it's, it comes out in little ways, the way that news executives act and say things publicly and the way they allocate their money. And it's, it's quite clear when you are looking at it from like the perspective of us um, who really is putting their money where their mouth is. It is very true that the budget, right, where the money goes shows what you really care about. Um, and I, I could not agree more, and I know that I've written about this before, about how can, even when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, how can we move to shift the onus away from the people of color to, to the organizations to solve this issue, um, the systemic issues, having these, these uh, leaders talk about and think about how can we dismantle the, um, you know, the, the systemic racism, the systems that exist, um, before we start recruiting a bunch of people of, in col of color, like how can we clean up our own house? So I think that's a crucial message that so many um, leaders need to, need to know. Erin, um, I'd love for you to talk to uh, us a little bit about the JOC Slack, right? We've referred to it a few times. This started mm -hmm. as a community space for journalists of color. Um, I was a member when I was, uh, <laughs> when I was working at the New York Times and remain one. Um, it's something I go to and look at uh, quite often, um, almost daily. Uh, so it's definitely been a valuable uh, resource for me, but I'd love to, uh, to hear you talk about that and how that community has shifted over time. Absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for being a member and staying engaged. Uh, yeah, so it was started uh, roughly five years ago by uh, 
uh, myself and uh, Julia B. Chan, who's a digital managing editor at KQED in San Francisco. Uh, we were uh, two journalists at uh, CIR over in the Bay Area. And we wanted, we just kind of felt like, you know, even within that space, which felt like, you know, had a fairly, at the time, they were staff and felt like we could really talk about issues of race and working as a journalist. We knew that, you know, often the conversations her and I would have kind of like after work, whether that was like over coffee or drinks or dinner, um, there could be a better space to do this to folks who maybe don't work in newsrooms that have uh, you know, other uh, POC journalists there. I mean, I, I think if you talk to any uh, working journalists of color, there's, we can probably speak to at least one time where we were the only whatever in our newsroom and kind of the isolation that came with that. Um, and so we thought, well, and, and at the time, Slack was kind of this new hip thing to use. And so we thought, hey, why don't we, you know, establish a space like this? So these conversations that tend to happen, um, you know, either, you know, at lunch or after hours, we can kind of have for folks who maybe don't have the, the built-in network that we had kind of established in our careers early on. And so that's really how it morphed. It, it really kind of became, um, initially was just a space to kind of just, you know, air grievances or to talk about stuff totally unrelated to journalism, like what you cooked this weekend or, uh, you know, your favorite, uh, what you were watching, you know, uh, on Netflix or on uh, Hulu or whatever, right? Uh, but what has been interesting is that the group has now morphed from, you know, a rough, you know, a roughly kind of small cohort of uh, journalists uh, across, you know, mostly first starting in the West Coast and then moving to the East Coast and kind of uh, broadly around the country to now um, an over 2000 plus group of people worldwide. Um, and beyond that is it is now extended to not just being like a, a community or collective of people who, who can air grievances, but it has now become an active space for organizing. So, you know, during the huge uh, uh, Los Angeles Times Black and LAT movement, uh, we got a lot of uh, members of the Los Angeles Times Guild into our group. Uh, you know, and, it, and it's now really kind of become this, uh, an interesting political space, which is something that like when we started, it was not the intent. Again, it was kind of meant to just be uh, an organization. And, and like, even though I'm a co-founder, you know, I'm literally one of 2000 plus people in that group. Like there is no kind of mission statement. We, you know, we don't collect any money on uh, for the rest of the group. It kind of just operates on its own, but it has now become, it has moved beyond a space of just, you know, friends hanging out and chatting to a space of actual organizing and dedicated study and criticism in media, which is, uh, which is now kind of interesting in this moment. I think that's something that we as the, the admins of the organization are trying to wrestle with. And like, it's a good thing to wrestle with, which is like, how can this space be move beyond just the kind of like cool safe space to talk but like is there more work we can do to embolden and can we like you know going back to this idea of power like there's a lot of power in this group now that did not exist when it started and so the question is how how can we wield that responsibly how we keep, how can we use that power as a collective to do something good for our organization um, and these are just ongoing discussions but that's kind of where it's at now we're in this really kind of interesting time uh, where we've you know where we can now actually think about uh, we used to just be a group of, you know, kids, I felt like, you know, adults, but, you know, kids, like, just like talking, whatever, online, and now we're really this uh, big group of people with a lot of opinions and, and who have moved into different spaces in our careers, a lot of new managing editors and uh, folks who actually wield power in the newsrooms. So it's really exciting to see, but it's a very daunting task, and that, I, I think, is what the biggest shift has been uh, over the last year. Well, I think it's I, I think it's been one of uh, the most important um, sort of uh, platforms, places for journalists of color that have just emerged in the last couple of years. So I really salute you and your co-founders and the admins and the people that keep it all going. Um, I think it's uh, what you've done is, is just really amazing. Um, so Michelle, as president of AJ, right, what I would consider one of the more established groups, right, you have NABJ, NHJ, Naja, and others, so um, how is AJ handling this moment of reckoning, right, um, and, and one thing that, that, you know, I and so many others have seen is just the, the number of uh, incidents directed toward Asian Americans um, in the sort of age of COVID, as well as the, the washing the mistakes, right, that news organizations have made uh, around this, like, you, you know, uh, early on for stories around uh, coronavirus, they were illustrating it with like static images of Chinatown. 
unacceptable, right? And I know AAJ really stepped up um, and, and, and became a voice and a force uh, uh, during that time. Just, so how, how is the organization really handling this moment? Yeah, it has been a crazy year for all of us, of course. Um, and also, I'm also a member of the JOC Slack, <laughs> so I'm with you. And I really love the community that Aaron, is, Aaron and Julia have created. And I think it's really great and something we so really needed. Um, you know, it's been a tough year to be Asian and Asian American and an Asian American journalist. And uh, that's really changed a lot of ways that AAJ has functioned this year. You know, we really thought this was going to be a banner year focused on the 2020 elections and that all of our work was going to be around civic engagement with the election. But early on, um, when the pandemic hit and the fact that it originated from Wuhan and the way it was really impacting media coverage and the way our members were being affected really had us shift our focus quickly. Um, we came out really early in February because we have a really vibrant Asia chapter and they started monitoring issues and flagging things for us quite early on. So we came out with guidelines in February um, for media outlets and their coverage on things to avoid, um, the best practices and kind of highlighting these issues. And since then, you know, our members have faced everything from racism on the job to uh, racism in their communities, people who, are, who were afraid to wear a mask and walk outside because they had they legitimately faced threats of physical violence just because of who they are and what they look like. And, you know, for us, we wanted to make sure we're supporting our community, highlighting this, these issues and making sure it's being covered by media outlets and being almost like an emotional and professional support group for our, all of our members. Because on top of this, they were also losing out on jobs. Um, they were getting furloughed. They were getting really worried about their finances. We had so many students graduating into a pandemic and no real graduation, um, early career journalists losing out on fellowship opportunities. I mean, the pain was really real. Um, so we quickly shifted to becoming a support network and making sure there are virtual opportunities for professional engagement and development, which is why we make, made sure that even though our in-person convention was canceled out of con uh, health concerns, that we created a virtual convention, which is gonna take place starting this weekend. So we really shifted and, and I think it, this pandemic has really made our community much more aware of the inequality that already existed and made us talk about it more. So when the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the, the new efforts around it uh, came about this year, I think our journalists were in a really good place to listen and, and really pay attention to those issues and look inward about where the AAPI community has been in relation to Black activism. So something that I found really interesting and that we elevated at the national level at AAJA is we heard a lot of our Asian American members talking about the history of anti-Black racism within the Asian American community, which we all kind of know existed, but it, there was the a degree to which our members focused on talking about this and forced each other to recognize it and talk about it and write about it really was new, you know, from really the years that I've monitored our membership's response to this uh, type of issue. Um, so we've tapped into that. We, as an organization said, AJ and our API community need to recognize our own faults within um, our community and how we may have contributed to the systemic inequality and how we need to own up to it. So we have um, developed more allyship focused programming around these conversations. Um, we similar have, similarly have been helping our members unionize and organize within newsrooms and share best practices as well as be a resource for managers as an organization for us. So we're kind of straddling both of those lines where we want to help the workers, but we also are a resource for the managers and executives. So we're trying to um, walk that line. And kind of like what Aaron said, um, unionizing and organizing, this is kind of new to us too in, in this space. You know, that's always been something that employees and, and journalists of color have really focused on and, and talked about. But the concerted effort to work across newsrooms to help each other um, organize uh, informally or formally, there is just like a really huge push now. So we're trying to shift to make sure that we're the best resource for our members um, and their work in doing that. That's excellent. That's, that is so excellent. And I, I really just want to push again AJ's conference is starting 
um, sued. I've seen the lineup. It's amazing. Really great programming um, for anyone and everyone, right? Um, so yeah, it, and this year, especially around the idea of allyship, we um, got rid of membership requirements to sign up for a convention. We wanted to make it uh, affordable to all journalists, whether or not they're in, in AJ or not. So we stopped distinguishing member rates versus non-member rates because we wanted to make it open. And it's little things like that that we hope, you know, is brings about greater changes. It's, I know it's just the membership rate, but it's it starts somewhere, you know? No, that's excellent. So to this point of allyship, right? So once upon a time, there was unity, right? Which was the umbrella organization for the Black, Latino, Asian, and Native American journalist associations. That dissolved years ago, right? And other groups have stepped up and provided more inclusive spaces uh, for collaboration, GOC Slack, um, uh, online news association, open news. These are examples of groups that um, sort of outside of that more traditional um, framework who, that I think have really stepped up and provided these really inclusive uh, networks and places for, for people to, to gather. Uh, what do you see as a good opportunities for a newer model or better collaboration um, across to, to even do more with this, uh, with the allyship? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I think the one thing that uh, the JOC community, the one thing that we as like the admin group have talked a lot about is uh, we've, we've heard interest both within the group itself and outside to basically be a, a Unity 2.0. And, uh, you know, while um, I'm only speaking for myself and not the greater community, you know, I, I have personally kind of pushed back against that, not because I don't believe in the idea, but because what kind of makes JOC work uh, is that it's kind of the fact that it is kind of a, in some ways, decentralized kind of flat group, you know, the fact that kind of, you know, as long as you identify as a working journalist of color, you can come in, you, we don't police any kind of the uh, kind of structure of the group, most to the point of just like, don't be mean. Uh, but, you know, other than that, it's kind of, the group kind of operates on its own. And so, um, but like to my uh, uh, point earlier about power and like how we can wield that, you know, we have had this question of like, how do we create maybe a better space for cross uh, affinity group allyship? And um, I think it's really important. I think the way I see it within JOC is, uh, you know, by allowing all these, uh, all bunch of different working journals from a, a wide array of uh, backgrounds to come together, hopefully out of that can build something that's more equitable or more, uh, that kind of thinks about what this allyship, allyship in multi-ethnic, multi cross-generational uh, kind of coalition could look like. Um, I um, personally just feel like uh, us building like Unity 2.0 would be difficult because, well, one, that's like another job. And, and uh, again, I, I, I'm trying to keep the number of jobs I have to do <laughs> down. Um, but uh, like I've been personally really um, uh, inspired by uh, things like the um, AAJ's executive leadership program, right, that has had, uh, you know, non-AAPI journalists join the group, you know, as long as you're an AAJ member, right? And I think that those kind of... Uh, 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 specific kind of targeted uh, fellowships are like a really great way to kind of build that allyship. So yeah, I'm curious, Michelle, what you think? Yeah, you know, there's still such a very um, political overtone when it comes to unity. That word is just very divisive still <laughs> among a lot of people. Um, and even though it dissolved years ago, it remains a very big point of tension because from a membership and, and broader journalism community level, it makes sense for Black, Brown, and Asian journalists to work together, obviously, in a formal way. Why not continue that? And it makes things easier for funders and sponsors because they have to just go to one convention. Um, it makes things easier for members from their perspective because they only have to go to one and they see the power in numbers. And I completely recognize that and understand that. And I, I think that building on these efforts that have developed post unity dissolving kind of like what uh, the JOC Slack is doing and various um, programs just becoming more inclusive is the right path to finding something perhaps more stable and more formal. Um, even though the national unity dissolved, our chapters, um, AJ chapters and AJ affinity groups, which are members who are banded around common career interests rather than geographic um, connections, those connections at the more local levels remain really strong and in fact have gotten even stronger in the absence of a national unity. So in the DC chapter of AAJ, for example, 
we've been hosting um, a job fair with the local NABJ, HJ, NAJA, and LGJA chapters uh, for many years now. And this has continued. So in our local area, we have continued to build on these relationships, host events together, host job fairs together to, to keep that relationship going. Um, and then for, for example, our sports task force at, at AAJA, there's a, a sports task force at NABJ and HJ as well. And they really work together a lot and they learn from each other. And these local relationships really, I think, are keeping our broader network together and um, continuing to build on each other. And I think the more that those efforts continue, it will then, you know, help us come up with a more formal and, and maybe more infrastructure based uh support around the local efforts. But I think that um, in this time, uh, building on those uh, connections that have formed after Unity is really what is rebuilding all of our larger journalists of color community back. Okay, so we have some uh, good questions uh, from the audience. And let me pull a few of these out for you. Um, so, and I want to direct this one to the both of you. I think this is a, this is a really, really excellent question. What is the best way for a white coworker who's not a manager, not in a manager position to help? This person says, I don't have hiring power, but I want to help work on the issue within our newsroom. I think I will say, first of all, asking that question is a very good sign that you're, you're a good ally. So. <laughs> Kudos for even thinking about that. Uh, well, one thing I can mention uh, specifically is I believe it's linked to on um, the JOC website. We have a resources guide toward the bottom of the sign up form with just assorted links to a bunch of different uh, guides, including like AJ style guide uh, and, and among other resources. Uh, but one of the really good resources there is um, Moise uh, Saeed out of um, uh, ProPublica, Lamvo of, Buzz, of BuzzFeed, and uh, Disha, who uh, I, she used to work at the uh, Star Ledger. Uh, the three of them created this really fantastic resor uh, JOC resource, uh, but there's a huge part of that that goes into allyship. And Moy specifically, um, he's been doing a lot of work around um, how, as a white ally, you can, you know, uh, impact, you know, or just use your, uh, your, your privilege and your standing to impact change and help your uh, colleagues of color. So um, I'll make sure to circle that around. But certainly, if you go to our website, we have like, that's like a, a very targeted specific way you can do that. Um, and then I think more generally, as Lashara said, you know, certainly speaking up, asking questions, listening, you know, that's always the best first step. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, the folks who you're working with directly listening to what they think is most important, I think is always uh, helpful. Yeah, I'm really grateful for this uh, question. Um, I've always like informally said that woke white men are our best allies. <laughs> and you don't have to be in a position of power, just being a white person, especially being a white man, inherently gives you power. And just because you don't hold the title of a manager does not mean that you're powerless. And I think that for this question um, to really frame like how they could help is just really helpful. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, white male colleagues I have personally benefited from because they cared and cared about diversity. And that's why I keep trying to say not just uh, diverse journalists, but diversity minded journalists, because I think we need both at, uh, at all levels. Um, I, in addition to what Aaron said, you know, I, there's huge power in being a white person who cares about this and talks about this to other white people. And I think when we talk about the burden and, and shifting of power, we can offload some of that burden onto you as a, a white colleague and a white male colleague, even if you don't hold a, a formal a power, a title of power, um, to kind of share this with us. Um, pitch the stories that you believe would be helpful for our communities. It's not just up to us to pitch it on our behalf, but for everyone to care about our, all of our communities. Um, if you see issues that are being raised within newsrooms that you think some other journalists of color should be weighing in on, you should also know enough to weigh in on certain issues and learn up on those issues so that you can inject yourself into conversations in a productive way and, and try to help um, and show that you are an ally. And I think there are so many things you can do, whether you're in a meeting, whether you're pitching a story, whether you're in like, at the water cooler, you know, uh, talking with other colleagues. 
um, white colleagues talking to other white colleagues uh, about matters. I think like starting those conversations and what people need to learn upon and what the areas of their opportunity to grow and learn. I think that's really powerful. That's happening a lot right now. And I would encourage that and, and also recognize that we are here again with the burden to help. That's excellent. Um, so I have two questions I'm just going to kind of fold into one. Um, I'd love to hear all of you weigh in more on the cleaning up your own house point uh, that Lashara raised. Beyond hiring, creating a workplace that works for journalists of colors, that nurtures careers, that adequately addresses these microaggressions. Um, just a little bit more on that. And I think connected is another question around, you know, what are the, the best, most constructive steps that you see newsroom executives take to advance the interests of gen genuinely improving DEI um, in, the, in organizations that you're familiar with? I know that's a tough one. It's a heavy, heavy one. question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will say this about the cleaning up your house point that I made. Um, I think that what's often missing in a lot of these uh, DEI efforts is uh, you, there's a rush to create a plan. There's a rush to hire a bunch. There's a rush to to do what looks good. And the step that seems to always be missing is the let us sit and acknowledge and explore and examine what are the ways in which we have failed, right? You can't solve a problem without acknowledging the problem. And I think that acknowledging the problem piece is what's often missing in, I would say 95% of any of these DEI efforts I've ever seen. The rush to a solution um, is not going to, uh, seems like a, a path to nowhere, quite honestly. Yeah, um, I mean, I could pick a stab at it. Maybe I'll develop more thoughts later. But, um, you know, I can tell you that something that I've found very helpful within my newsroom is that um, is having managers uh, reach out to me personally and my colleagues, uh, regardless of what their background is, to ask them for their feelings and thoughts during this moment and around this issue. And um, I've had people, managers call me just out of nowhere, which always kind of freaks me out because I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> but they just wanted to talk and wanted to hear what I was feeling and thinking and, and how I think our organization um, is lacking and how we could improve. And that just those conversations, the outreach, the phone call really just put me in a situation where I felt like I could be honest with my assessment. And a manager who is white, who is male, um, or you know, any manager just reaching out to a colleague who they know care about this and has been thinking about this for a long time and coming from a position of just listening to process what you're thinking and feeling, I think is extremely powerful. And I think it's through these conversations that as employees, we can start um, feeling hopeful that greater changes will come over a long period of time. Um, and another thing that's been helpful for uh, me as well uh, is that I've had um, mentors and, and other managers reach out to me and kind of help me find resources about the history of um, inequity in journalism. So we've been sharing like old articles that have been uh, circulated decades ago around this topic so that we can all come from a similar base of understanding of what came before us and how we can improve um, from here on. And for us to have a conversation around like how frustrated all of us are, whether you're white or what background you're from, um, how frustrated we all are about the fact that we have this conversation again decades after you know they first started having those conversations. So having managers and other colleagues reach out to those like us who have been in this space for a long time to learn, share resources, and just listen, um, those steps I think have been extremely productive from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, the education step is crucial, and also kind of the uh, coming together to share uh, feel like how folks are feeling. Um, like I agree with Lashara that there's often this rush to immediately uh, set up roles. I mean, we saw that this year where like, you know, several newsrooms, including the Washington Post, uh, created roles around diversity and inclusion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 
reporter reporting roles being focused around race and around policing. Um, and, you know, any uh, journalist of color can tell you that these things, again, these aren't new issues that suddenly arose in 2020. Uh, they've been here for uh, centuries. And so, um, you know, I think that uh, while it's very, you know, why I applaud uh, organizations that are stepping up to do that, uh, there definitely needs to be a moment first to recognize how did we even get to this moment. And so to uh, Michelle's point, I certainly think that I've also had uh, 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 colleagues white and otherwise reach out to me, uh, just not only ask how I'm feeling, but to kind of get like a real candid view of what's happening. Um, and also, you know, understand that they, you know, when they reached out to me, they, 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 they made sure to acknowledge that, you know, I'm basically, they're relitigating my trauma and that, you know, that it sucks that they have to do that too. But I mean, I, I've had colleagues, uh, like the amount of times I've talked about what it's like to be a black reporter in the newsroom now, it's actually really um, stunning because it's a moment that, again, I've dealt with my entire career, but to have, uh, you know, upper management reach out and actually talk to me is, is, is really, uh, it's like really illuminating, something that I hadn't ever experienced. Um, a further, I think, like concrete thing that can happen is as opposed specifically uh, we've had, and we've seen this in other places too, is that um, your guild or your union, if you are, um, or if you do have an organizing or collective bargaining unit, can be really effective at taking kind of these discussions that happen uh, internally and kind of the, uh, you know, the kind of like, you know, re-understanding of how do we get to this moment to then move further into actual actionable steps. Um, the, the Washington Post Guild has done a pretty fantastic job, in my opinion, of not only listening to uh, the the feelings of uh, the black colleagues of the newsroom as well as other groups, but then I've tried to put that into actual, actual actionable things that they're requesting from uh, management. And so I certainly think being able to have some kind of group, whether that's a guild um, or any kind of just like collective group that's arguing on your behalf to be able to bring that directly to management is another great way of taking the conversations that happen um, you know, with your managers, things like that, but then actually try to be like, how do we now take what's happening and actually translate that into change, whether that's, uh, you know, more uh, transparency around the, uh, the demographics of the organization with the transparency around and, and how that translates into, say, uh, positions to, uh, or, or past to management, uh, salary, benefits, all of that, you know, that's where your guild can really have some power and taking the, you know, kind of the, the theoretical and turning it into actionable. Yeah, and just to add one more, um, especially speaking of the power of the guild, um, I think this is a good time for newsrooms and news executives to review the policies that are in place that affect journalists, especially journalists of color within their own newsrooms. Um, right now, there's a big uh, reevaluating of our social media policy, uh, which has already been discussed publicly, um, and the, in, the ways that the existing policy has affected uh, the ways that journalists of color or, or women journalists are able to express themselves publicly, and the personality and the, the humanity that they bring to their jobs and how certain policies can affect them in, in hurtful ways. Um, and so I think the Guild could be a huge, uh, powerful presence in, sor in sort of pushing those policy reviews to the forefront and making sure that you know things like policy, uh, social media policies, or pay, um, pay schedules, or time off policies, how these internal procedures that have been in place for a long time uh, may have contributed to the way journalists interact within their own organizations, and how that could create, uh, bring about greater equity and and um, equality within the newsroom. So I think this is a good time to really think do that sort of cleaning house and look at the policies that are in place and, and for the guild to really hold the user managers to account. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Michelle. You both are doing really important work to lift up this cause of equity in journalism. And as we've heard today, the hard work continues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.